thank you for joining me for another Sunday Afternoons with Reverend Lucretia. I'm so glad you're here. So the name of today's talk is, Is Ego Our Enemy? And the song is, I Am That, I Am, by Michael Gott. If you would like to listen to the song before you hear the talk, just go ahead and click on the link. It will be in the description below. So we're going to be talking about edging God out. That is how Wayne Dyer describes the ego. We're going to be talking about how it separates us from each other. Uh, so we're not going to be talking about Freud. So not ego, id, super ego, none of that. Just the daily use of the word ego. We will be talking about how it represents an unhealthy belief in our own importance. We'll talk about the definition and different perspectives on the ego, as well as Ego is the Enemy, the book by Ryan Holiday. We will have a talk called The Other Side of the Ego, which is about a homeless man uh, who saved a very successful businessman. So we'll talk about that. We'll talk about scripture, the metaphysical definition of ego, as well as lose your ego, find your compassion, which is a perspective of the Islam religion. So ego itself is not good or bad. A healthy ego is good. Being egotistical is not good. The worst part of the ego is that it wants to keep us separate from each other. The even worse part than that is that it wants to separate us from God. So if there is a constant balancing act between self-confidence and knowing that all of our strength, wisdom, grace, talents, love, all of that actually comes from God. So the song, I am that, I am, talks about, I am darkness, I am light. I am day, I am night. The infinite evolving eternally the same. So there's always juxtapositions. There's always two sides of the same coin. The great I am lives inside us and outside us as well. So Oprah talks quite a lot about the ego. She's got a podcast now and she's put together several of her favorite interviews on certain subjects and put them together as podcasts now. And when she talks about the ego, she says it is that part of ourselves that identifies with self-image, personality, talents, accomplishments, perceived weaknesses, everything that encompasses our false self. The ego draws a line, separates you from everyone else. This is me, this is the other, when in fact we all share the same source of spiritual energy. The ego makes judgments and longs to feel special and it operates out of fear. She says we can deal with it calling our false self out by saying things like, that's my ego flaring up and you will begin to diminish its power. You are not your past, your social status, the shape of your body, the size of your bank accounts. It all has no bearing on your true self. Father Richard Rohr is one of the persons she talks about quite a bit, and he talks about the true self and the false self. And he says that it is our job to follow the path to the true self. The false self is the fabricated, concocted self. It is not bad. It is created. It is a persona comes from education and race and sexual orientation, what country we're from. He says, that's not your true self. He says, again, it's not bad. It's the raw material you fall through to find your true self. So letting go of the false self, somehow he says, people don't kiss up to me and I get very offended. But then when I ask myself why I'm offended, I realize it's because they were touching on the false self. It could never be the real self because the real self can't be offended. It's too large, it's too grounded, and it's too real. And as we know, the real self is that God self, that creator self, that spiritual self that keeps us at our center. So Wayne Dyer talks quite a lot about the ego. And he reminds us that in our first nine months, we trusted. We didn't ask God, are we going to have a nose or ears or a mouth or whose parents are going to be ours or where are we going to live? We just trusted 100%. And then somehow when we came out and we became individuals, we started taking up this false sense of self and the ego started to develop and we started to edge God out. The idea we carry around is I am what I have, what I do. I am separate from everybody, separated from what's missing in my life, and I am separate from God. The higher self wants you to be at peace. The ego wants you to be in a constant state of turmoil. They talk about dominance versus tolerance. That is what the ego teaches us. Tries to convince you of your own separateness. They are convinced that if you don't dominate others, they will get the best of you. And actually, as you know, when we're living in our spiritual self, there's no need to dominate anybody else at all. It's about tolerance, seeing the world as it is, rather than as you demand it to be. 
The ego part of us believes who we are, what we have, and what we do, and what other people think of us is what defines us. The ego comes from a place of fear, so we need to shift from fear to curiosity. He says whenever you're afraid, just get real curious about what it is that you're afraid of. Find out all the information that you can, and that will hold back the anxiety a little bit. He also talks a lot about taking all of this stuff that you're attached to and starting to let it go. Because our ego is so much built on what we have, if you want to diminish the size of your ego, you start giving away your stuff. Shift from a sense of entitlement to radical humility change from needing more to a mantra of contentment. If you realize you have enough, you are truly rich. That's a quote from Lao Tzu. So live in a world of ambition is where we are now, but we have to accumulate more and be ahead of the other guy. That's what our ego tells us. We have to compete and be better than everybody else. And then when we aren't, we get depressed. So to be yourself in a world that is constantly trying to make you something else is the greatest accomplishment. That's a quote by Ralph Waldo Emerson. And it all talks about the fact that you have to be who you are based on what your needs and desires are, not based on what the outside world tells you that you should be. So Ego is the Enemy is a book by Ryan Holiday. And he said, we must learn how to deal with the enemy to be able to do what we've come here to do. We've all come here for a purpose and we need to be able to do that. And the only way we can do that is by controlling the ego. It's the unhealthy belief in your own importance. He talks about the three phases of life. The first is aspire and then success and then failure. Aspire is that phase in life when you want to attain mastery. It takes an infinite number of hours. So, you know, there's a book that says the 10,000 hour rule. He says it's not really about the 10,000 hours. The fact is that for all of the time that you're here on this planet, you need to be getting better and better and better at whatever it is that you've decided is your journey in life. And that journey takes forever. But our ego says, I'm ready. Let's go. Let's do this thing. Even when you're not ready. He says, we must develop the craftsman passion mindset, constantly trying to get better at what we're doing. Be humble, show up and do the work. The ego tells you to fake it and cut some corners. And that's what we need to control. So he talks about this state of being called euthymia. When you identify what your path is, and you don't compare yourself to others, that's when you get the result that is tranquility. It's about consistency, that you're not in a race with others. You're focused on who you are and what you're here to do. It comes with clarity, courage, and consistency versus the ego. He talks about sweeping the gym versus the I got this. The ego will tell you you don't have to do that menial job of sweeping the gym. It's beneath you, it's below you, that you've got this. But the reality is to be really, really good, you've got to sweep the gym over and over and over. Every single day, you got to sweep that gym. And every single day, you need to get better and better and better at whatever it is that your craft is, whatever it is that you've come here on this planet to do. So his story is he was very, very smart. He got uh, a mentor very early on. He got a great job. He wrote a book. He said he had the trappings of success, and that caused him to have a temptation to tell a story about himself, to create a myth and to create a false self. He says your talent becomes your identity and your accomplishments become your worth, and that's neither honest nor helpful. So he says he handed his freedom away. He couldn't say no to the money and his work became labored. He didn't enjoy it anymore. He lost his faith in himself and others and that collapsed. His faith in others collapsed as well. His quality of life was gone. He became a workaholic. He became very compulsive. And he says, this came with a price. I was trapped in my head. I was a prisoner of my thoughts. The work role of work was outsized. In other words, it was way too big. Work came to be the most important thing in my life when it really shouldn't have been. It took over my sense of self. He said, my ego cost myself and the people I admired millions of dollars and it held us back from our real goals. So he then started to study this. He wrote the book, Ego is the Enemy. He had written a book prior to this called The Obstacle is a Way, which is the philosophical study about how getting over obstacles is what makes you stronger and what makes you better at what you're doing. He says, the question we need to constantly be asking ourselves is, who do I want to be and what path will I take? Put your goals above your need for recognition. That's a key foundational point. Put your goals above your need for recognition. He says, think less of yourself, be less invested in the story you tell about your own specialness. 
this will make you liberated and be able to accomplish your work that you've set out to achieve. Being a student and everything you do will constantly undermine your ego, which is what you want. So I've got this great story, this hero story of this man, Jonathan Gravenor, and it's called The Other Side of Ego. He wrote a book of the same name. So he was a TV journalist and an anchorman. He was very successful. Um, in 2012, he got a cancer diagnosis and the cancer diagnosis taught him to be a better man, he says. So the day of his diagnosis, he had to sit down with his wife and his daughter and tell them that he had late stage throat cancer. And his daughter said, I don't care if you live or if you die. So there was lots of anger, lots of yelling and screaming. And he said he was a broadcast journalist. He traveled around the world. He was a foreign correspondent. He thought he had provided this incredible life for them. And he didn't understand why there was this anger. But he said he had to do a lot of soul searching. And he asked himself. And what he found out was that he couldn't remember the last time that he hugged her, made her feel safe, or told her how proud he was of her, or said, I love you. So he had to undergo a radical neck dissection. Golf ball sized tumor was taken out. Uh, so that, that dissection is from the top of his ear all the way to the bottom of his Adam's apple. And he found out after the surgery that the cancer wasn't gone. He had to have chemo and radiation. He said, I was more scared than I had ever been in my life, but I did it alone. I didn't ask for help from my wife or for my daughter. My ego did this. I was dying to be close, but I pushed them away. So his pride, after he had had this fight with them, his pride told him, oh, well, I don't need them anymore. I'll just do this on my own. But he said he was dying for help but he wouldn't ask for it. After the treatment, so after his radiation and chemo treatments, he would walk around downtown, busy downtown area to get away from his thoughts. And he said, when you are ready, the teacher will appear. That's a very well-known quote. And he said, this homeless bum, as he called him, turned out to be the greatest teacher. So his first thought was, how dare you? You should have a job. You are not more of a victim than me. The little kids in chemo, they are the victims, not you. But he saw him every day and the man actually never reached out and directly asked for money. He just said hello to everybody and was very pleasant and offered greetings. So finally, Jonathan walked over to his side of the street and the dog, the man's dog, came over and sat in front of him and looked up at him. And the man said, she doesn't normally stay, stand in front of people unless they need something. What is it that you need? And Jonathan got all offended and he said inside his head, wow, this is a scam that he's got going with the little dog. But he decided not to say that out loud. And what he said out loud was, she must have known that I needed a friendly dog to pat. So he wanted to go back and give them something. Um, he had enjoyed talking with them over the couple of weeks, but he said, I didn't want to give them drugs or alcohol money for, because you know they'll buy drugs or alcohol with the money if you just give them money. So he bought them a sandwich and some coffee and some biscuits for Molly. And when he went to give the man the food, the man held out his hand to shake his hand. And um, they started a conversation as if they were friends for a long time. And the man said, I'm not going to have this food unless we share it together. So Jonathan sat down next to him on the sidewalk and they ate and they became friends. And he said this was the only time when he was talking to this man that he forgot that he was actually sick. So the man pulled out a pill bottle, and his name was Douglas, and it said that the medication that he was on was actually for schizophrenia. And so he said, so Jonathan said to him, is this why you're begging? And the man, Douglas, pointed to the sign, and there was on the sign the groups listed of people that he was actually raising money for. He wasn't actually even raising money for himself. And he said, I realized it was not him who was disabled. It was me. The judgment that I had had blinded me to the truth of this man's gracious intent. So he saw him often. One point, Doug called him over to his side of the street and he gave him a box of chocolates and Jonathan got all teary and um, he teared up and said, thank you, my friend. And Doug said to him, I don't have any friends, especially important ones like you. And so Jonathan came to this realization, I lived my life trying to be important and I never felt more important than at that second. I was important just by giving my presence. He said he wouldn't take the chocolates unless we shared them together like we always did. So they looked at the sea of people that was walking by them and he realized people were looking down on us like we were less than them. But I realized that I had the best view. He opened his coat. It was a cold day one day and he opened his coat to let Molly in. He was going to give Molly a hug. And Doug said, 
Doug saw the huge big scar. So the scar went from the top of his ear all the way down to his anemic apple. And Doug said, I know you're going to be okay. And Jonathan actually got very emotional. He was talking about his cancer diagnosis and how scared he was. And Doug grabbed his arm and said, you're going to be okay. You have a lot more to do. So he sniffed and he turned his head and they both, you know, were men. So they couldn't look at each other while they were sniffing. Um, but they just exchanged space. And he said, sometimes words are not necessary and just being together is the important thing. So Jonathan walked away and he was crying. And he said, it's the first time since his cancer diagnosis that he knew he was going to live and that he had a real purpose. So while he was going through this chemo, there was a little girl that was also going through the chemo and she had that gray skin that you get. Um, when you have chemo and the scarf, she had lost all of her head. And, and Jonathan said, I didn't want to look at her, but I, I couldn't look away from her. And so at one point I decided to try to make her laugh. And so he made all these faces and she laughed and he said it was a wonderful experience. And the nurses came over and they all laughed together. And he said that he couldn't wait to leave and go tell Doug about this experience. And when he went to tell Doug, Doug was gone. And so he went back for weeks. He couldn't find him. He phoned all the agencies, but because of privacy laws, they couldn't tell him where Doug was. Um, and he said, I lay in bed and thought at night about where was Doug and what about Molly? Was she in a shelter? Was she going to be put down? And he realized the impact that this quote unquote homeless bum had on his life, that it had turned into one of his best friends. And so one of the things he wanted to tell Doug was the, about this little girl in chemo and that when he leaned over to say goodbye to her, she put her hand up on his face and he, Jonathan, started to cry, and this little girl was wiping the tears away from his eyes, and he understood what it was to feel close to this little girl. He said, he understand, I wasn't scared of dying, I was scared of living. I had lived half a century avoiding negative emotions, trying to insulate myself against the poor and the needy. I had surrounded myself with rich, powerful people thinking I would be happy. And every once in a while when I had guilt about the homeless, I just thought, well, when I make lots of money, I'll just give them lots of money. What I spent most of my life avoiding at that most desperate time in my life, the homeless man and the sick little girl gave me everything that he needed. So he has a lot more to do, he said. He's seeing other people and receiving other people, giving them the power to heal others. Uh, he's changed his relationship with his wife and his daughter. So when he got ready to do the TED Talk, he didn't tell anybody. He wasn't boastful. He didn't call everybody and say, look how great I am. He just called, he told his wife and his daughter and his daughter said, daddy, I'm so proud of you. You're going to be really good. And daddy, I love you. And so it was just this really heartwarming story about how this very, very successful um, anchorman TV personality with a lot of money um, who had looked down on people all of his life, this homeless mom and this very sick little girl had been the ones who actually saved him. So let's talk a little bit about scripture. So pride was mentioned 63 times. Arrogance is mentioned 18 times and humility is mentioned 15 times. So Proverbs 16, 18 says, pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. Proverbs eleven twelve: 12, when pride comes, then comes disgrace, but with humility comes wisdom. I love that. Psalm 10, 4, in his pride, the wicked man does not seek him in all his thoughts. There is no room for God. And I picked that that one because we talked about ego is edging God out. So it's saying right there, he's not thinking of God anymore. Isaiah 2.17, the arrogance of man will be brought low and human pride humbled. The Lord alone will be exalted in that day. Galatians 6.4, each one should test their own actions. Then they can take pride in themselves alone without comparing themselves to someone else. And I pick that one because we talk about the fact that a lot of the ego is about comparing yourself to everybody else. But you're supposed to just take pride in your own actions, asking yourself if you did the best job that you can do. So arrogance. Uh, 1 Samuel 2.3 says, do not keep talking so proudly or let your mouth speak such arrogance for the Lord is a God who knows and by him deeds will be weighed. Psalm 17 10 says they close up their callous hearts and their mouths speak with arrogance so humility is on you know the biblical historian that i talk about all the time says that in the bible humility is freedom from pride to humble ourselves is a condition of god's favor and his supreme requirement god dwells with the humble jesus made it the cornerstone of his character by his humility he drew people to himself 
So here's a quote, Philippians 2, 1. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing of the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion that make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, rather in humility value others above yourselves. I think that sums it all up. So metaphysical, let's look at the metaphysical definition of the ego. The ego is the I, the ego is man. By reason of his divinity, he makes and remakes as he will. So the divinity gives him the ability to create his personality. But in this lie, his greatest strength and his greatest weakness, the ego of itself is possessed of nothing. It is a mere ignorant child of innocence. When the ego attaches itself to sense consciousness, known as the adverse ego, it causes all the trouble in the world. Its selfishness and greed make men grovel in the mire of materiality when they might soar in the heavens of spirituality. I love that. So I wanted to talk about this article, Lose Your Ego, Find Your Compassion. So it is by an Islam leader. His name is Faisal Abdul Rauf. He's an author and an activist whose goal is to improve relations between the Muslim world and the West. So he has three books on Islam. You know, I'm trying to bring a whole lot of diversity into this. Um, so he has three books. One of the best known is What's Right with Islam is What's Right with America. So he talks about the Quran. There are 114 chapters. And he says every single chapter starts with a prayer to the compassionate God. So God speaks to Muhammad. He is considered the last in the series of prophets. Um, other prophets are Adam, Moses, Abraham, and Jesus. And they were sent to have compassion and to show compassion to humanity. He says, adorn yourself with the attributes of God. The primary attribute of God is compassion. We must be speakers, actors, and doers of compassion. Our source of lack of compassion is the outer path versus the inner path. The battles that the prophets waged are battles of the self, the battles of the ego. He says the sources of all human problems are egotism. Merging oneself with divinity is the lesson of the spiritual path. Muslims regard Jesus as the master of Sufism, and he came to emphasize the spiritual path and become so much an instrument of God that his own will is taken away. He is the person, and only God's will shows through. God's will is manifesting, and he's not acting from his own self-ego. Compassion is in all of us. It is here. It gets. We can only feel it when we get our ego out of the way. We have true spiritual experience. When we have that, the boundaries of the egos are dissolved. We feel at one with divinity, creator, and every human being, the deepest love and the deepest sense of compassion and mercy that we've ever experienced. That moment, which is a gift from God, lifts the boundary, which makes us insist on the I and the me. Instead, we say, this is all you. This is all us. We are all part of you, O Creator. You are one for whose purpose we live. Our message and purpose is to remind people of the truth and the knowledge of who they really are. So when we sleep, we have dreams and visions. We travel outside our bodies. We see beyond the limitations of space and time. We understand that we are so much bigger than just our physical selves. Always inside us is the presence of divinity, absolute love and mercy, compassion and wisdom. There is only one absolute being, and we need to concentrate our awareness on compassion and love that we are part of. The primary attributes, which means to be human, are human bodies embodying the peace of the divine soul, created in the divine image, and the absolute being is compassion and love. He says, we have to be proper stewards of the breath of divinity within us. Seek to perfect within ourselves the attributes of being alive, wisdom, consciousness, compassion, and loving. Common platform on which we all must stand. When we do, we will be convinced that we can make a wonderful world. We have reached a stage in human history when we must lower our egos, control our egos, personal, individual, or national egos, and let all be for the glorification of the one. So here's what I know. Ego is really tricky. It can tell you one moment how great you are and the next moment how inadequate you are. A lot of the lesson is about not judging yourself against the outside standards. More important is the lesson that we are not separate, we are part of the whole. And most important is that every quality that I've got comes from God. 
the good ones that I can share and the bad ones that I can learn from. It is really about being in a constant state of growth, a constant awareness of who we really are. It's not a competition. It's about learning together how to be our best selves. Remember at all times, the power is in you. It always has been and it always will be. If you like this, please hit the subscribe button and hit the little bell so that you can be notified whenever I come out with a new video. And if you'd like to know more about my ministry, please go to lostinsideministry.com. I thank you so much. I send you on your way with many blessings.